looking at about five years ago. It started Dr. Richard Luker. Many of you may know Dr. Luker. He was an uh, evangelical Christian who, about 50 years ago, really heard from God who told him that he needed to do this. And so he started a cardiac rehabilitation program in uh, Albuquerque, at first at one of the schools. And he did that for about 40 years. And about uh, 2000, uh, Blake Chancellor, the owner of Blake's uh, restaurants, had coronary artery bypass surgery. Of course, you could say that, that uh, Blake's lot of burger contributed a lot of the atherosclerosis of the Albuquerque. <laughs> but, but anyway... <laughs> In a, in a way to repay everything, uh, Mr. Blake then gave some money to donate to generate this building. And that, you've probably all seen it because it's on 601 Lomas. It's just up the street from the Taqueria and down the street from the, from the uh, Embassy Suites. And it's about a 7,000 square foot exercise facility. And it's basically a medical program where we take care of patients who've had either heart attacks heart surgery, uh, they've had a stent. And now since I came, we've started four different programs uh, as well. One of the programs is pulmonary rehabilitation. And the pulmonary rehabilitation is for people who've had uh, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, and are quite limited, usually on oxygen. The other program is a program that I started because uh, several years ago, I got very interested in the field of cardio-oncology, which is a field that uh, is uh, emerging all over the country. And it deals with cardiology and oncology problems, because many of you know that patients who are uh, treated for cancer very often take drugs that have important side effects related to the heart. So that's now become a, a major specialty in some of the places. When I went back to look at these programs, I went back to Duke where I'm still on the faculty and discussed with them the program. And it was, it was a uh, pretty startling program. They actually have four full-time cardiologists doing nothing but cardio-oncology. But what interested me while I was there was the data that showed that exercise at any phase of cancer is really important. It's important to have people who are uh, diagnosed with cancer to begin to exercise so that they can tolerate their treatments the best as possible way. And while they're getting treatments, it, we'd like to have them exercising in order to not become debilitated. After the treatment and after they're cured, the most likely disease that's gonna take their life is cardiovascular disease. So it's a very important program. I could not get the oncologists and this is not unique to our community, it's true all over the country to refer patients for this. So finally, one of our generous donors gave us money to do this program for free. So it's a 12 session program over a month with a trainer. And we've had a large number of patients who've now come to join this program. And then after they're done, we talked to them about nutrition, we talked to them about uh, exercise, of course, but after they're done, we give them an exercise program and they can go to their own gym and, and work out. But the important thing is that people with cancer really should be exercising. The other program that we have is called uh, a program for the COVID survivors. These are people who are what are called long haulers. They get COVID, very mild disease. Sometimes all they do is test positive. Then about three or four weeks later, they're starting to get symptoms. And many of you have probably heard about this. And if you know anyone who's had COVID, they might be suffering from this. But they get chest pain. They get continued shortness of breath. Some of them get brain fog and a whole variety of symptoms, which may or may not be related to the COVID. But the problem is debilitating. In the most recent study of about 1,500 people, and I reported this recently on television, looked at the incidence of this post-COVID syndrome and they found that about 30% of the patients who'd had COVID were still suffering from problems four to six weeks after the disease was over. So it's not always such a benign disease. Everybody says, well, most people don't die from it. That's true, but it can very well be debilitating. So those are the programs. And the final program that we have is called New Heart, New You, which is a program that is designed for people who don't have heart disease yet. That's a program 
that goes for three months. And it's, uh, it, it, it's a reflection of my feeling about prevention is that I would see patients in the office who would have um, high blood pressure, they'd be obese, they wouldn't exercise. And I'd see them every year. And I'd say, God, you got to start exercising. You got to start doing something to take care of yourself. And they come back the next year and it's precisely the same. They weighed the same. They still weren't exercising. In fact, they were sitting even more, uh, particularly this last year. And so I started this program. And this is a 12-week program, very similar to cardiac rehabilitation, which is 12 weeks. It's a program where they meet with a trainer and a nutritionist for 12 weeks, once once a week. And they're given an exercise program and a nutrition program. And that's been a very successful program in terms of weight loss. And so patients, patients really like that. A lot of my partners at the Heart Institute uh, really enjoy it. As, as many of you know, I started the Heart Institute back in 1972. And now we have about 30 providers that have been acquired by Loveless over the last couple of years and uh, have, have a very wonderful, uh, we built the heart hospital in, in 2000. So I, Stephanie, I take it you've not got the PDFs yet. No. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Let's just talk about what we can do for a healthy heart. And let's talk about uh, a patient that I was going to present uh, in graphic forms, but I'll tell you about her. She's a lady who is 61 years old, who was sent to me at New Heart because she had a high cholesterol. And she didn't want to take statins. Many people really don't want to take statin drugs because they have this idea that the statins are toxic or that maybe there may be some problems with statins. And so they, they don't take them. And so they're looking for a way out. And so I went through this lady's uh, situation. What we do is we, we have a score. Many of you may have heard of the Framingham Risk Score. It was done, started about 50 years ago, and its database is huge, and it has an idea of what your risk for heart disease is, is using general criteria, your blood pressure, your weight, your age, your ethnicity, whether you're male or female, your cholesterol levels, your blood pressure, whether you're active or not, whether you have diabetes. Now, this lady was like a lot of the patients that I see at Newark. She was overweight. She had a BMI of 33. And her waist size was also um, in, a, in a range that put her at great risk. In fact, the waist size is probably a more important predictor of heart disease and mortality than your BMI, the waist size, it turns out, is a reflection of how much fat you have in your abdomen, around your abdominal organs and, and on the surface. And it turns out that that's a very major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So um, her waist size was, was increased. So she had some hypertension. She had a LDL cholesterol. And if you're familiar with uh, the cholesterol, when you go to your doctors, they they get a cholesterol panel, they get a total cholesterol, which is not that important, but they get the LDL cholesterol, L stands for lousy, get the LDL cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, the HDL is the, is the happy cholesterol. And that's the level of, of uh, cholesterol that you'd like to have a lot of. Unfortunately, there's not much you can do about it except exercise. There are no, no medications for it. But her LDL cholesterol was not particularly high. It was 110. And it used to be that we'd sort of say, well, you know, that's not too bad. Don't worry about it. But it turns out we have better ways now to make a diagnosis. So somebody asked me, uh, what is the single best predictor of whether or not you're going to have a heart attack besides uh, your, your uh, smoking? It would be a test called the coronary artery calcium score. And if you haven't heard of it, it's a test, it's a low energy CT that you take a picture of the heart and it stops the heart in motion and it tells whether or not there's calcium in the plaques that involve the coronary arteries in your heart. And if you have calcium in those arteries, that means you have coronary artery disease. So this woman, if she has this coronary artery calcium score, which she did have, and her test showed that she was a zero calcium at age 61, her chances of having a heart attack are almost zero in the next 10 years. 
So it's a really important test. And I find it very useful for patients like this who have many risk factors who are reluctant to do what they need to do in terms of exercise and diet, but also are reluctant to take medications to lower their cholesterol. Because we do know that when they're indicated, and they're not indicated in everybody, those cholesterol drugs, the statin drugs, really do offer uh, an ability to reduce someone's risk for, for cholesterol. I'm curious, is there anybody in the audience that's taking a statin or had some resistance to do, to do that? Stephanie, I don't know if you can unmute them in case there's a question. Um, anyone who's muted is probably muted themselves or oh. if there's background noise, but I see a thumbs up. I see Karen, hi, I see Sue's raising her hand. Feel free okay. to talk, to jump in. Yeah, if, if, have you had any trouble with the statins? No, no. Yeah, and I, and I think that's really the truth for most people. The, the statins are really pretty benign drugs. You know, when you're talking about 40 or 50 million people who are taking statins, you have to understand that there are going to be a lot of different side effects and some have absolutely nothing to do with the statin. It is true that some people, a small percentage of people will get muscle aches with statins, but that's a very small percentage. And in fact, when they do the studies, it's no higher in the placebo group than it is in the statin group. So it's important, but I think that, that uh, in, the, in the case of this woman who's 61 years old, has multiple risk factors for heart disease, that I would have encouraged her to do this. But the way that I did it was to do this test. And once we had the results of the test, then it was, it was pretty clear to her that this was a reasonable way to, to take care of herself. What I find with most patients, and I think that most of you would agree, that if you can give science behind what you're recommending, it makes sense. It also makes no sense uh, to take any vitamins or supplements to try to prevent heart disease because there's never been a single study showing that they are beneficial, despite the fact that probably 100 million Americans are taking those every day, but it's, it's not uh, particularly helpful. So this woman does have coronary artery disease. We did a coronary calcium score on her and she scored she had a score of 250, and that doesn't mean much to you, but a score of zero is important. It's kind of like being pregnant. If you have calcium, you're at risk for heart disease. If you don't have calcium and you're a 60-year-old woman, uh, your chances of having a, a heart attack are extremely low. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't take care of yourself for a whole variety of reasons. So what do you do to try to be good at your heart to protect yourself from from heart disease. So I'd, I'd love to see a show of hands of how many people exercise on a regular basis. It's gotten harder to do during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really a problem. In fact, one of the things that I tell people, Stephanie, is that pe the sitting is the new smoking. And it's yeah. a disaster because people have not gone out. They don't go to gyms and, the, and it's hard for people to do at home. Actually, New Heart has a home program where you can go on to the, your uh, YouTube and, and see some exercise programs at home. So it's, it's huh. one opportunity for people. But it, it is murder. It's been terrible for, for exercise, uh, uh, along with all the other things that it's done. So what is, what is a normal or reasonable amount of exercise that people get? Well, many of you remember the original study that was done on this was done on London bus drivers and, and conductors who ran up and down the stairs to, to get tickets. And they found out that the bus drivers were heavier. They had a higher risk for heart disease, about a 30% lower risk than the people going up and down the stairs. And that's really true for everything. So uh, over and over, there, there is clear evidence that not only is survival for every reason, but the more sedentary you are, uh, the more likely you are to have cardiovascular disease, but it's also a risk factor for other problems like cancer. But what we know is that you don't have to do a whole lot of exercise. The, the major increment is getting off your rear end and, and just doing some walking. But what we tell people, what the evidence would suggest is that at least two and a half hours of exercise a week, 30 minutes, five times a week, 
is, is the way that you want to do that. But the other thing that a lot of people don't do, which is you want to do strength training, and especially as you get older, it's very important to do some core strength training at least 20 minutes twice a week. So we're talking about two and a half hours of aerobic exercise. Now that doesn't have to be on a treadmill. That can be walking. It can be gardening. It can be other activities, but it's not sitting. I tell patients who sit, and very many people now are working at home, uh, to think about getting a, a desk that's a standing desk. I've used a standing desk for several years. I think there are a lot of benefits to that. One is that you don't get tired when you're using it. It's very it's hard to fall asleep when you're standing up. So it's, it's a little bit easier when you're sitting down in a chair and sort of doze off about three o'clock in the afternoon. So I'd really recommend that you think about doing it. You can get one for about two or three hundred dollars at Costco. So it's 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 definitely something that that you might consider. Uh, as I said before, smoking, so, excuse me, sitting is the new smoking. People aren't smoking as much, but they're sitting a lot more. And if you look at statistics on, on sitting, time spent sitting, and we all sit, let's say I, this lady was a, is an accountant and she sat at work all day, then she'd go home and watch television at night. And uh, this is murder. It's just not a, not a healthy thing to do. So what we try to do as far as exercise is concerned is to get people interested. And that's what we do at New Heart. We have a very program. So someone comes in, let's say they're in the New Heart, New You program, trying to prevent heart disease. They'll be put on a treadmill. They'll be using an elliptical trainer. They'll use a bicycle. So they do it all for about 10 minutes and they gradually increment the amount of energy they're expending. One of the most interesting and important uh, revelations in exercise is that not all exercise is the same if you're trying to lose weight. And the type of exercise has become very popular is called high intensity interval training or HIT. And it's easy to do. You can do it when you're walking. And what you do is you increase your energy level for a period, let's say for a minute, as fast as you can go. And then you slow down for a minute and you do that on and off for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. That ends up burning more calories than just regular continuous exercise. Studies have looked at metabolism and nobody really understands why this is, but if you exercise, let's say for 20 minutes continuously and 20 minutes using the high interval, interval training, you'll find that you lose more calories if you do it with exercise. Now I'm, I'm the first person to tell you that exercise is really a hard way to lose weight. It ought to be part of your program, but it's not going to be the answer. Uh, eating is really has to do with the uh, with the weight loss that that uh, that you're trying to achieve. But we do encourage people to exercise, and if you're trying to get some benefit, the high intensity program. So in in the new heart, new you program that we do, uh, it is predominantly uh, people mostly come to it for weight management. Although a lot of people who are out of shape. We're seeing COVID pa patients who have been closeted up with during the COVID epidemic who are coming in for exercise. And I think that uh, what people need to understand is that if you don't exercise, you just deteriorate. And the older you get, it's a bigger problem because as you age, your muscles atrophy anyway. And if you're sedentary, they're going to atrophy at a more accelerated rate. So it's important not only to do aerobic exercise, but also, as I said before, the strength training is, is important. And there are a whole variety of ways that you can do this. One of the books that I recommend is from a friend of mine, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was a colleague of my wife and a, and a very close friend. And, and Ruth Ginsburg, as many of you know, had colon cancer, and then about 20 years later developed pancreatic cancer and also had a stent placed during the course of her life. And, and when she was uh, first diagnosed with colon cancer and got treated, her husband told her she looked like a wreck and she had to get a trainer. So she got this trainer who trained, trained judges at the uh, Court of Appeals in Washington and now trains them at the, at the highest court in the land. They currently have a gym at the top of the Supreme Court. And Ruth Ginsburg was trained by this trainer and she wrote a book called the RBG. She didn't write it, her trainer wrote it, 
RBG workout book. And it's a great book. It's like $10 on Amazon. But if you're thinking about a home program, this is a terrific program. She has a lot of exercises that you can do at home for core strength. Uh, you know, it's not really an aerobic program. It's really a program for improving strength. But it's a, it, but it is a, it is a very neat book. And I would definitely recommend it. So what we're saying is two and a half hours a week doesn't always have to be vigorous exercise. It can be just getting out and walking. And then, if of course, if you're a really high intensity person, you can do it a little bit less time. But that's the general recommendation. Think about doing high intensity interval training. You can read about it. If you go, I write a newspaper column on this magazine called Prime Time, and I wrote about this subject high intervent if you want to have any more specific information you just go to the prime time website and look at it so the the next area that we focus on and it's really important is the whole idea of nutrition i've lived through and you've lived through newspaper clippings telling you that butter is good butter is bad carbos or carbohydrates are good uh, one of the sort of markers in my life was an argument between Dr. Atkins, who wrote about the Atkins diet, and Dr. Ornish, who wrote about the Ornish diet. And Dr. Atkins believed that the reason that Americans are so fat is because when we told people to look, go on a low-fat diet, that what they did is eat a lot of carbohydrates. And that's really true. If you look at junk that's out there like snack wells, which are all carbohydrates, they said, well, there's no fat in them. There are a lot of calories, and it may very well have contributed to obesity. Uh, so that when we talk about carbohydrate, we're really talking about sugar. And if you think about in your diet where the sugar comes from, you may not be drinking sugary drinks, but you do drink eat white bread. And eating white bread is the equivalent of eating sugar because it just goes straight into your, it's refined carbohydrates, refined grains, and it, it's lost all of its uh, value. So if you're going to eat bread, you want to get whole grain bread, even though you have to get used to it, I think. But, it, but it's a much healthier type of bread. But what I try to focus on is, is carbohydrates that are in, embedded in fiber. For example, every morning I'll have blueberries and strawberries. That won't spike my blood sugar. And there's a reason you don't want to spike your blood sugar because when you spike your blood sugar, your body produces insulin. Insulin, not only does it make you hungry, it also causes you to lay down and lay down fat. So it's simple sugars are really what you want to avoid. Carbohydrates per se are not necessarily bad if they don't raise your blood sugar. But the argument was, on, and, and Atkins had this diet, and it, was very effective in getting people to lose weight, uh, but nobody could stay on it, not very many people. The keto diet is very similar to that. You can have as much steak as you want, all the fat you want, but you can't have a, a, you know, you can't have a piece of bread. So I think that uh, uh, that diet is an extreme diet. My feeling is that you're not going to get anybody to go on any kind of a diet that they can't live with. So the, the other extreme is the vegetarian diet, which is what Ornish talks about. Not bad if you can become a vegetarian, but some people would rather live a few years less and be able to eat occasional hamburger. So I, th I think it's a, it's a choice. But the diet that I really believe in is the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet, as you know, is, is based on the studies that were done probably 50 years ago when they looked at the incidence of heart disease in, in the world and found that the Mediterranean companies had the lowest countries have the lowest incidence of, of heart disease. And there's a commonality of the diets, even though there are many different countries around the Mediterranean, there really is a commonality to the diet. Number one is it's a more plant-based diet. Fruits and vegetables constitute about half the calories that you're getting in that diet. And the wonderful thing about fruits and vegetables is they keep you full. And that's the wonderful thing about the Mediterranean diet is that, is that it makes you full. And, and you don't crave foods and you can have as much as you want <coughs> as you're having the type of uh, diet that, that is um, healthy. That means that you're not eating a lot of saturated fat and you use olive oil instead of uh, the butter or 
uh, the hard margarine. As far as the uh, fruits and vegetables are concerned, you can really consume as much as you want. In fact, I think Weight Watchers, I haven't followed it lately, doesn't even count uh, fruits and vegetables as far as calories are concerned. There are high fiber, low calorie uh, choices that you make and they won't spike your blood sugar and they won't make you hungry. I think the best thing you can do about a Mediterranean diet is just look up, there's a huge amount written about uh, this diet and where you can find it. But one of the points that I made earlier is that people are more likely to do what you ask them to do if you explain to them what the science is. And there have been a number of studies on the Mediterranean diet showing that it definitely reduces the risk of second heart attacks. It reduces the risk for her first heart attacks, but it also has other benefits. The risk for diabetes goes down and the risk for even dementia is lower in people who have this kind of diet. So there's something in this Mediterranean diet that makes a whole lot of sense. And it's something that you definitely want to consider it, when you're talking about dying. It's also um, new studies I've seen showing that children of celiacs, if they're on a Mediterranean diet for the first couple of years of life, have a lowered risk of developing it. Oh, is that? Well, that's interesting. The University I, yeah. of Chicago has a study out. Well, I would believe that. Yeah, anything, any, uh, I think you can almost say it's one of those diets you can find a benefit, for example, a lower risk for cancer in, in patients with uh, people who follow that kind of a diet. I think there's, there's clearly a relationship between red meat and, and carcinogenesis. Genesis. So I, I think that's, that's a good point. I didn't know that about celiac disease. Boy, it would be nice to prevent it because that can be a pretty disabling disabling disease. But I think everybody who thinks about diet, that would be the one that I would I would mention. At the New Heart, New You program, that's the diet that we emphasize. But again, when if you're have, struggling with a problem of weight, you really have to do more than just uh, think about eating. There are many reasons why you eat that have nothing to do with the fact that you're hungry. Very often you eat because of depression, you might eat because of anxiety, you might eat just out of habit. Uh, if any of you were ever smokers, you know that so many, many cigarettes that you use really just have to do with habit, uh, although the, the nicotine is, is part of it. So the Mediterranean diet is, would be at the bottom line is, is what we teach at, at our program, and it's, a, it's very effective and people, people really like it. It's a great diet for weight loss. It won't give you a weight loss quickly, but it will, over the long run, allow you to lose weight. And there are a number of studies to show that, that the, you really reduce, reduce your risk for heart disease and reduce your risk, in my case, where we see people who've had heart attacks for, for a second heart attack. I won't say anything about cigarette smoking because cigarette smoking is so obviously bad that uh, no matter how much you do, it's, it's terrible. And it's, it is a disaster as far as your heart's concerned. One of the areas that I haven't mentioned, but I think it's really important because there've been some new studies that have come out in the last four or five years. That's an area called inflammation. Probably the best way to think about inflammation is the fact that you have uh, arteries that have fatty plaque in them. And when you have a heart attack, the plaque becomes inflamed. And even though you may not recognize that you have inflammation in your body. There are certain situations in which you're more likely to have it. One is, of course, obesity. Uh, the other are chronic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and other diseases that are inflammatory. But the word inflammation is very important. In fact, there was just a study that was published about two or three weeks ago looking at an anti-inflammatory drug. If any of you have, cold, have gout, there's a drug called uh, colchicine, which reduces the uric acid, but it's also an inflammatory, anti-inflammatory drug. And they gave it to people who have heart attacks. And it's independent of cholesterol and everything else. And what they found was that those people who took colchicine after their heart attack had a lower risk for subsequent heart attacks and cardiovascular events. This is a, a game changer. And now more and more we're learning that inflammation is a major mediator in terms of causing heart attacks, as well as causing other diseases like cancer. And you'll read more about this as time goes on because we're, doctors are moving more and more toward 
an anti-inflammatory approach. It turns out that statin drugs also do have some potential anti-inflammatory effects, but studies now showing that just the reduction in inflammation can reduce your risk, risk for a heart attack. The other area that I'd like to mention because it's such a common problem is diabetes. If you have diabetes, your risk for cardiovascular disease, and especially heart attacks and strokes, is much higher than it is in the general population. There's a syndrome called the metabolic syndrome, which is a pre-diabetic state. And about 20% of people who have it go on to develop diabetes. I always say it's the disease that's the most common disease around, but nobody ever talks about it. But it begins with obesity and it begins with truncal obesity. So if you have a lot of weight on your hip, that's not a problem. But if you have the weight in your abdomen, in other words, you've got a pot belly, you're increasing your risk because there's a lot of inflammation in all that fatty tissue. And uh, as you know, patients who are obese also are at higher risk for developing complications from COVID. But this syndrome is associated with several other features. One is sleep apnea, where you obstruct your airway when you're sleeping and you snore. And that leads to poor sleep and it leads to tiredness when you wake up in the morning and tiredness in the afternoon. But the other thing that prediabetes, the, the metabolic syndrome does is it causes prediabetes. In other words, it causes insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is bad because if your body doesn't respond to your insulin, it will make more insulin. That leads to deposition of more fat. It leads to greater amounts of hunger. So all of those things are, are, are a problem. And uh, the metabolic syndrome, which really emanates from, from obesity. And 90% of, of the metabolic syndrome patients uh, are, are obese. And as you know, diabetes actually can be reversed and, or put into rever remission with uh, significant weight loss and certainly a lot easier to take care of if you, if you lose weight. So I think that's an, another important area that I think we need to focus on. I apologize to you for not having any visuals. I had some, some great visuals. I actually spent a fair amount of time working on them. And I had, uh, but I think what I'm gonna do, if you'd like, is that I made a YouTube video of my lecture. And I think what I'll do is I'll put it online and we'll let you, you can look at it. And if you, if you can stand this again, I have some great, great pictures and a lot more information uh, that I had when I did it. But I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. We can email that link out to everyone. And I still haven't <laughs> gotten your presentation uh, in my, not there. I don't know what's with this hotel. I'm not sure either. I, it's, uh, I, I'm so sorry about that. I don't, I, so, you know, what happened is I actually logged on. I was in the meeting. There was nobody there. And I said, well, I'll log off. So I logged off and then I could never get back. But I apologize for that. But it's, it's nice to, to meet all of you on this nice Sunday morning. I hope it's as nice in Albuquerque as it is in 